OK, so the next speaker is going to be Steve Foster, changing from pathogens to insects now, and he's going to talk to us about monitoring and managing insecticide resistance in UK pests. Over to you, Steve. Thanks, Lynn, and good morning, everybody. Could I have the first slide, please? So, yes, um, monitoring and managing insecticide resistance. We've been doing this for quite a few years now at Rothamsted uh, through collaborative funding from a range of funders, chemical companies, agronomy companies and DEFRA. And I'll take this opportunity to say thanks to you all for that funding to allow this uh, monitoring to uh, continue. Next slide. So uh, I thought I'd start with a Larson cartoon, a cartoon I like very much. Great moments in evolution. Uh, next animation, please, Laura. And I think new cases of insecticide resistance are great moments in evolution. When I say great, great for scientists who want to study uh, this process and selection. However, not great at all for the chemical companies, uh, uh, agronomists and growers who have to then suffer uh, from being unable to uh, control the pest in question. Next slide. To put it another way, here we see a, a scene from Jurassic Park life will find a way and when you have the development of a new a release of a new insecticide it's always under pressure from the evolution of resistance you know pests are are constantly mutating uh, and these mutations can confer resistance and indeed we're seeing this at the moment with the covid19 situation with the new strains the new mutations causing uh, creating new strains which uh, debatably or not are are less uh, vulnerable to the vaccine. Next slide, please. So here, just a summary of pest management strategies. Um, a couple of animations. Uh, next click, please, Laura. Importantly, detection. You know, which pests and diseases are present and are levels high enough to need treating? Uh, next click, please. And an important component of that still, is, as Lynn mentioned, is chemical control uh, with correct timing, uh, getting the sprays in the right places and very importantly monitoring for any potential resistance to the chemicals that are being used. Next slide please. So as I said at, at Rothamsted for many years now we've been doing resistance monitoring and we can see some of the bioassays that we're using on live insects to assess uh, their response to a range of ins relevant insecticides. There's topical assays, a leaf dip assay, glass vial assays, and at the bottom right there, a systemic assay where we're putting the, in this case, aphids onto leaves that are dipped into the appropriate chemical. Next slide, please. So just running through a few species that are, are part of this monitoring program. And uh, the main player for me is the peach potato aphid. Comes in various colours. Unfortunately, it's not colour coded for resistance, which make life a whole lot easier. But we've been monitoring for uh, the response of this particular pest over the years. Next slide, please. Um, and the, the main reason it's a pest is that it transmits a whole range of viruses. And here we can see beet yellows virus in sugar beet, uh, a picture taken by Mark Stevens a few years ago, um, and these viruses cause yield losses. Next slide, please. Um, up until relatively recently, we had the neonicotinoids as seed treatments. Next slide, please. And we've been monitoring uh, in, in peach potato aphids, so their response to uh, a measured amount of uh, a neonicotinoid to see if there's evidence initially for reduced sensitivity, which may be the precursor to, to stronger resistance, or indeed the strong resistance that we now know exists uh, due to a target site mutation in mainland Europe. The good news is um, in the UK so far, we haven't seen any evidence of any sh shifts upwards with the reduced sensitivity, or indeed any evidence of these aphids that carry the strong resistance. When I say good news, is it? Next slide, please. Um, it, it isn't really because we've got now the legislation that's been that's banned neonicotinoid seed treatments on all outdoor crops, um, cereals, sugar beet or seed rape. And what is the fallback for growers? Click please, um, Laura. 
Next, next, thank you. Um, in a lot of cases, it's the pie reef with sprays. Look, for example, on all seed rate, that was the only real fallback position that growers had. Next slide, Laura. Um, so we've been monitoring fall resistance in misers over the years, and you can see here uh, a graph going back to 1996, looking at KDR, which is a, a knockdown resistance, which gives moderate resistance to pyrethroids. And the reason I've shown this is that you can see it's a roller coaster ride. It's down, it's up. You can never say exactly where you are. So if you don't monitor maybe for a couple of years, you could actually be well out to what, what is out there uh, and what the levels of resistance are. So monitoring needs to continue and it needs to be really every season. Next slide, please. So let's move on to a few other pests before I come to an end. Uh, cereal aphids. I mentioned we've lost the neonics on cereals now. Um, we've been and the fallback has been pyrethroid insecticides, and uh, we've been looking at the response of a, a three main species to pyrethroids. Next slide, please. Um, and the problem that uh, we all have with cereal aphids is like with Mises persky, they, they transmit viruses, in this case, barley yellow dwarf virus, which uh, can severely affect the yield of the crop. Next slide. Um, a colleague of mine, Martin Williamson at Rothamsted, has developed also a, a, a method, a molecular assay for looking at whether aphids carry uh, these viruses. And you can see in uh, Rapalocyphon pedi, these are some results from aphids that were collected in suction traps through the insect survey and the levels of virus that they carry. So we do have the ability not only to look for resistance, we can also look at, at, at virus levels in, in these aphids. Next slide, please. Um, uh, in the meantime, I've been doing bioassays. Here's the slide with two uh, baseline clones. The yellow is a fully susceptible clone to, uh, to pyrethroids and the lilac um, is a, a, a clone that carries KDR and has moderate resistance. Uh, click please, uh, Laura. And we can see here just a, a sample that came in recently and where it sits and it sits very nicely on top of the lilac points, which means it has similar levels of resistance. It probably carries KDR, but the important thing, it isn't shifted further to the right, which would indicate high levels of resistance and probably a case where the growers wouldn't be able to control uh, the aphid at all with a pyrethroid spray. Next slide, please. Uh, cabbage stem flea beetles, uh, they've come to the fore over the last few years primarily uh, through the loss of the neonic seed treatments on all seed rape and also the fallback of uh, the use of pyrethroids. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, they are very damaging insect. The adults create these shot holes in the seedlings and indeed can actually kill the cotyledons, which means you lose the seedling. And also later in the season, we have larval problems as well in the stems, which can, can cause problems uh, with, with, with yield and, and the plants um, surviving. Next slide, please. And Lo and behold, we found pyrethroid resistance in cabbage stem flea beetles, and this is a yellow sticky trap from last year. And you can see the, the problems that growers are up against, the numbers of these beetles that are flying and coming into the crop, and the fact they can't control them with pyrethroids because this pyrethroid resistance has evolved. And when coming to the end now of my, of my talk, just a few more slides. Next slide, please. Uh, willow carrot aphid concerns with transmission of viruses in this species and I found evidence using a glass file assay of pyrethroid resistance using a rate that's equivalent to the uh, field rate. The problem with this species, we don't have a susceptible baseline. It seems every time I look for pyrethroid resistance, every aphid seems to carry it, which is, sounds like bad news for growers. Next slide, please. Pollen beetles, uh, a metabolic mechanism, like in cabbage stem flea beetles, a different metabolic mechanism, but we do know about pyrethroid resistance in this species, and we've been keeping an eye on that over the years. Next slide, please. Um, and, and also diamondback moths. Uh, there was a big influx of this species, pest species, in 2016. Uh, I received samples and demonstrated that there was pyrethroid resistance. I handed them to my colleague Martin Williamson and he showed that they carried KDR and super KDR. The important part of this piece of work was initially growers were using pyrethroids and CRD 
uh, was, were telling them that, that they should work. Um, I demonstrated that they weren't going to work because of resistance and that allowed the, uh, the growers and advisors to get an emergency registration of a diamide, Benevia, which actually would work because my, my bioassays show that. So it just shows how important monitoring can be. This is an illustration of how important knowing what's out there, whether they're resistant or not to different chemicals. Next slide, please. So just to finish, the past, we enjoyed a, a, a good diversity uh, of compounds and here we can see what we're considered to be each tool could be a different compound with a different mode of action. Next slide please. However we're getting to the situation here and a couple of clicks please uh, Laura. We're losing our compounds not only due to resistance but due to legislation. Interestingly now we've left the EU people might say well we should be okay. That's not the case if we're exporting products to, to Europe. We still have to uh, sit within the legislation. Next slide, please. So the Crop Protect Act, which will give up to date information on, on pests, insect pests and whether they carry resistance is very important. And uh, hopefully that, that that's the way forwards for us to manage uh, what we have left as uh, insect insecticides. Thank you. OK, thank you very much, Steve. You've set this up nicely for Sam Cook's talk that's coming up later, which is alternative ways of controlling cabbage stem flea beetle. Um, I'll take a, I've got a couple of quick questions here. Um, Garth Drury would like to know, is the resistance monitoring done using nominal standard approved doses of the compound? Or if not, in the leaf disc, leaf disc test, what, how do you decide what concentration to use? Right, well, as I mentioned during my talk, the way to choose a screening dose is to create a susceptible baseline. So you, you have uh, individuals from that particular pest that you consider not to be resistant to the compound. So you, you do a dose response and then you choose just to the right of the top dose that, 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 that kills everything. And then you can obviously diagnose any shift or insensitive to your resistance with that dose. So it's a case of doing that baseline first. Once you've got the baseline, you make a decision on which dose is relevant to distinguish between a susceptible uh, pest, uh, a form of the pest, and that that might be resistant. And a quick answer, I hope, to this one. Paul would like to know what proportion of flea beetles are resistant to pyrethroids? I think I could uh, almost answer that. Well, uh, a PhD student Caitlin Willis has been working on this over the last few years, and essentially each year we've been looking uh, at the percentage of, of individuals, in this case adults, that are resistant and it's going up each year, it's shifting more and more to the right. So Caitlin would be better placed to answer this, but it depends where you are, and which field you're in, but at, at least 50% um, and indeed I think in nearly every sample we received last year we had resistant individuals. So it's it, it's a growing problem, I'm afraid, year it's on year. It's quite high now, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah, in some cases it's 100% in at the sample. So every beetle that you, you test in the sample that comes in is resistant. OK, and there's a very interesting question. I don't think we've got time to go into it in much detail, but Andy Barr would like to know, do beneficial insects develop resistance? I suspect that's something we would like to know a lot more about. It is, and indeed, uh, Sam Cook and myself were involved in a, a project called EcoStack, yeah. which is you, you at Wide, where we're doing exactly that. We're looking at evidence of resistance, in this case, to pyrethroids in beneficials using the glass vial assay. And yes, we are finding some interesting results, particularly in parasitoid wasps. Yeah, they no, do appear to carry work. resistance. Yeah, I think I think there's a lot more mileage to be had there. Okay, yes, can we go to the next speaker, please? Thanks, Steve. Um, okay.